Okay. Okay. okay, now we start the second session. That is, we run a practical vanillarization with AIDA. So after this tutorial, I hope you are much more familiar with AIDA. So I will start with a introduction of using AIDA for calculating quantum dispersal band structure. And in this tutorial, first tutorial, we will have a look at this basic AIDA data type and also these workflows and the job submission, job status, and the result analysis using AIDA. And then we will launch a one year 90 bands workchain to use this SCDM method to calculate the one year interpolated bands. And finally, I will give a brief introduction of our latest work that is to use a different uh, automated initial projection disentanglement method for high throughput one yearization. So let's first have a look at this submission script for the PW bands structure. As you can see from the last figure, it's only 24 lines. So with these 24 lines, you can already get a quite decent quantum dispersal band structure at the, at the right. So this is the power of AIDA. So we will go through line by line of these 24 lines and uh, help you understand the different aspects of AIDA. So first, let me remind you that we have three different interfaces to interact with AIDA. The first is this Verdi shell. It's actually a customized IPython shell. So we can use this Verdi shell command to initiate this interactive IPython, IPython shell. And then you can, for example, import these AIDA modules. The second one is this Verdi command line interface. So we can use this Verdi command line for example, use this Verdi status to have a look at your configuration of your AIDA. And also we can write a Python script to launch your AIDA workflow. So let, let's first start with the first part of the script. So essentially we define a code that equals this QEPW 6.8 at localhost. So what does this mean? So first let's have a look at these basic AIDA types. So in AIDA, to automatically record the provenance, we have some basic types like this ORM.int and ORM.float. And also we have this ORM.computer and the code to model physical computers and executables. We also have this advanced data and trajectory data to model these advanced data structures for band structure and also this relaxation trajectory. And also we have the types for calculations and workflows. So these types are like the Python class and the nodes in AIDA is like the object. So for each node, it has this PK that is the primary key, which is an integer to represent the, the node. And also it has this UUID, which is this universal unique identifier to help you identify your node. And also some, some nodes have this human readable label, like for the code, it has this, uh, for example, the code has this label that is this QEPW 6.8. So you can just use this label to ident identify your node. So we, in Verdi shell, we can use this ORM.load code to load your code into this IPython environment. Also, we can use this Verdi command line interface, this Verdi code show, to show this configuration of your code, like this is the absolute path of this executable. So the second part of the script is to read an atomic structure and convert it into an AIDA structure data. So here we use the AIC.read, that is this read function from the AIC package. Then we convert it into this AIDA structure data. So we have this automated provenance. Then we store this structure into the AIDA database. So the third part is we use this PW bands work chain to get a builder from this PW bands work chain. So essentially you pass the code, the structure, and we're using this fast protocol to get a builder. So uh, what is this? This builder, so we 
let me remind you of this workflow in AIDA. So we use this cal function and the work chain workflow work function to decorate this normal Python functions. So we have this automated provenance. So in this, for a complex work chain, we use the Python class to define this outline to run a pra practical workflow to calculate the band, for example, the band structure. So the work, work chain builder is like uh, that. So the AIDA will automatically populate the input parameters according to your code and your structure. So if you want to change the predefined input parameters, you can just modify the builder. The builder is like a Python dictionary. So you can change everything before submission. So for example, in our code, we skip the relaxation by remove the relax key. So we can have a closer look at what is the builder. You can print the builder is essentially like a dictionary. So it has this band key, which contains the, as you can see, this pw.x input parameters and also contains the number of machines that will be used for the MPI run. And also this max work clock second also contains the pseudo potential. So the builder also have this relax part. So if we have this relax and define simple parameters, the AIDA workflow will run the relaxation. But for because we, are, we want to calculate the band structure, so we just remove this relax part. So AIDA will skip this relaxation. Also, it has this self-consistent part. Also, it defines these input parameters for the pw.x. And so, so that you can change this builder before submitting this to the AIDA daemon. So the last part is to submit the builder. So after you run this submit builder, the AIDA daemon will take care of creating the input file, the real input files and then upload these files to the local or remote cluster, then submit to the Slurm PPS or these job controllers, and also monitoring the job status. So once the job is finished, it will retrieve the output files, parse and store the results into the AIDA database. So when your job is running, you can use this very process list to list all your jobs. For example, this is the job, this 20 United Bands watching that I launched 18 days ago. And also we can use this very process report to show the, the each step inside your work chain. For example, the first step is the self-consistent step. Then it launched this bands calculation. So finally everything finished successfully. So you have a band structure. To visualize the band structure, you can use these AIDA function, this very command, command line interface, this very data bands export. So you have this a PDF file for your quantum espresso band structure. So, so as you can see with these 24 lines, you can get everything, this band structure from this a single crystal structure input. If you change this file name to any other structure, you can work well and give you a band structure. So in my opinion, this is very clean for anyone, even, even if you don't know quite a lot for the, the input parameters of the quantum espresso, you can still get a decent band structure. So uh, in our tutorial, we will launch this quantum espresso band structure, and then we will also launch a one united band structure. So the one united uh, workflow implement this SADM algorithm. So the SADM is implemented in the PW2 one united codes. And this, we use the projectability to determine this n, mu, and sigma for the SADM parameters. The workflow is implemented within AIDA. And also in, in the Valerio's paper, we validated uh, 200 crystalline materials and also 81 insulators to evaluate the interpolation quality. And the result seems quite good. So, um, so on materials cloud, you can find these all the provenance, the full provenance of all our calculations in this automated high throughput linearization entry. So everything is on materials cloud. So for example, you can find select a structure and then have a look at this crystal structure and also this 
calculation results, the band distance of various <laughs> methods. And also, we can compare the BFD band structure with the one-year interpolated band structure for isolated case and also for entangled case. So thanks to the full provenance, we can track everything that we have done with this automated one-yearization. So for the one-year 90 band structure work chain, the bands work chain, this is, we specifically designed it to be almost the same as the PW bands work chain. So instead of a single code, now we have this pw.x project with function pw to one united and one united but all you need is only to pass these codes into the work chain and we use the same interface so codes the first is code and then structure and the protocol we use this fast protocol to speed up the calculation so it will use a set of reduced parameter to reduce the computational time but as you can see this is the same as the pw bands work chain so in this second tutorial, we will launch this the one united bands work chain to compare your one year interpolated bands with the quantum espresso bands. So finally, I would like to talk a little bit about our recent uh, uh, research on automated projection and disentanglement. So different from the ICDM one year function, one yearization. So we we develop a new algorithm to do the automated one yearization. So if we think about how do we choose the SCDM parameter, so we use this projectability from the project wave function dot x. So essentially we project the block wave function psi onto a set of localized atomic orbitals inside the pseudo potential, this GN. So, so this GN are the, in the inside the pseudo potential. So if we look at the initial projection of the one year 90, it also used this local a set of localized atomic orbitals. But here we were using some analytic orbitals from the hydrogen, the solution of the hydrogen Schrodinger equation. So why don't we use these numerical atomic orbitals inside the pseudo potential to use this as the initial projection for one year function? So these pseudo potential numerical atomic orbitals are for the valence electrons. They contain the angular momentum information such as this SPD and F. Also it contains the radial part of the weak function for each element. So in, in principle, it should be better adapted to a different element than using a single hydrogenic solution. So after we exclude the semi core states, we can use these projectors as the initial projection of one year functions. So in fact, we can create a table of initial projectors for all the elements to do this automated one year realization. So I'm not using this uh, pseudo atomic orbitals, this uh, abbreviation as in, in the paper. I'm using this NAL because apart from pseudo potential projectors, we can use different type of numerical atomic orbitals. For example, here I tested some orbitals from this OpenMX package, which is a linear combination of atomic orbital package. So when we usually when we one year write the silicon band structure, we can only have a good description, a few electron volt above the uh, conduct conduction band minimum. So if we include further this D orbitals into our one year functions, we can expand much more the description of conduction bands. As you can see, we can even describe accurately 10 electron volt above the conduction band minimum. So this tells us that we can further explore different projectors to improve the flexibility of one year initial projection. Also, we can use the projectability information to do some different disentanglement. So for example, in this graphene case, on this left, Panel. This is the projectability, the band structure projectability of the graphene. So as you can see, there are some atomic orbital-like bands inside these free electron bands. These color bands are, has high projectability on the, these atomic orbitals, while these gray lines are like free electron bands. So if we have a window disentanglement, that is this, this froze mac or this froze mean, this win max and this win mean, so we can only use a horizontal window to 
freeze the states. Instead, we can use the projectability information to freeze only these atomic orbital states. So on the right, the rightmost panel, you see if I use projectability to freeze the high projectability states, we have we can recover much better these atomic orbital like states. That means our one year functions are more restoring the atomic orbital picture of these time bending models. So here we have these two parameters, the Pmax, which if the projectability is higher than this Pmax, we freeze the high projectability states. While if this projectability is smaller than this Pmax, we exclude this from the disentanglement process. So in, with this trick, we can exclude these free electron bands and only do a one-year function from these atomic orbitals. But these atomic orbitals are not universal across different chemical environments. So for example, for silicon, the conduction band minimum has low projectability. So it's like around 80%. So it's not always, if, I, if we only use projectability disentanglement, it's not always good. You can find that here, the conduction band minimum are not well described. So instead, we can use a combination of projectability disentanglement with window disentanglement. So we freeze Fermi, Fermi energy or conduct, conduction band minimum, uh, one or two electron volt above these two. And then we use projectability disentanglement to freeze still high projectability states in this conduction band region. So this will help us better restore these atomic orbitals. So instead of tuning the this froze max, we now we only need to tune this p and p max. So usually we only need to set this this froze max as the CBM plus one or two. So this so we further do some quantitative comparison of our new projection with the with respect to the ICDM projection. So to compare the interpolation quality, we use two uh, measures. The first is this average band distance, and then this also the maximum band distance. This average band distance, like the square difference, and then this root. So if we change this fictitious new, for example, we set this as Fermi energy plus one electron volt, then we are comparing bands below Fermi energy plus one electron volt. So, so here we, so as we, we have seen this projectability, this PME and PMAX is kind of unspecified parameters. So how do we choose this? We further implement this optimization blockchain in AIDA. So we can, so it can find the optimum PME and PMAX by sweeping all these parameters. For example, here we have this optimal band interpolation error and this combination of PMA and PMAX. Or for other material, it might be quite stable. So you can either choose one of these PMA and PMAX. So with this new projection, we compare the band distance between the ICDM one realization and also the new method. As you can see, the band dis distance is more concentrated towards zero. So quant quantitatively, you, see, you can find the band interpolation error is better than the SEDM. And also for this eta max from 300, 300 to 60 mini electron volt. And moreover, when we compare the spread distribution, the new projection, almost all the one-year functions have spread less than four angstrom squared. So while you run this SEDM one-year function, it has some large spread one-year functions. So with this new projection, we are, we are happy. So we launch around 20,000 structures to do a real high throughput one-yearization. So as you can see from the result, this, uh, so now it's over 17,000. So it's like, uh, we have very accurate band interpolation really on the mean electron load. Also, uh, so finally, I, I didn't show other statistics. So. So finally, today we're not going to use this new method because it's just still not fully in, uh, incorporated into the quantum espresso. So today we're only, we'll use this SCDM one-year function, one-year to launch a 
automated granularization. So you can use this command to copy the tutorials files into your folder and activate your virtual environment by this work on AIDA. And then I prepared two scripts. This, the first is the launch one year .py, so you can pass it a crystal structure and launch your one year addition. Also, there's a launch PW band, so you can calculate your PW band structure. And also, I prepared a tutorial, or we prepared a tutorial on this, uh, this web page. So you can follow this tutorial step by step. So it has a very detailed explanation of all the steps to do an automated one year addition. So you can follow all the steps. And finally, you will have a band comparison like this. So you can really see the accuracy of the automated one year addition. And, uh, and finally, if you have any questions or issues in the future, just uh, need to create pull request or create issues on this uh, AIDA repository. And also you can ask questions on this AIDA mailing list. So to, we will have help to solve your problem. And uh, that's the, today's tutorial. So I think you can start uh, working on this. So everything should be already there. Okay, now you just need to copy these two files, copy these folders, and also the link for the tutorials in this readme. So you can click this link and uh, start your exercise. And also, there are some optional questions in this web page. So if you have finished uh, your tutorial, you can try to answer these optional questions. Yeah, so that's all for today's tutorial. Thanks, Jinfeng. Okay, so there were a few technical questions mm -hmm. that were asked during the presentation of Jinfeng mm -hmm. by Giovanni Pizzi on the chat. Giovanni, maybe you can summarize very briefly the questions you were asked and the answer you gave. Sure. So, let me just go back. Uh, I think that the first question was very practical, which was what is the meaning of ORM, the acronym? The acronym stands for Object Relational Mapping. Object means a Python class, uh, and relational means a database table, because on the, on the back end, either we store everything in a database in order to make it possible to query easily the results, but what you see in Python are Python classes. And so there is a mapping that says, okay, a, a data node becomes this in a table and so on. And that's why it's called an ORM. It's a very standard name in computer software engineering, let's say, and the databases. Uh, the second question, which is a bit more general, actually a question um, we get relatively often is how can I, if and how can I either connect to supercomputers which requires some type of uh, multi-factor authentication or two-factor authentication, something like you have to press something on your mobile phone or you have to put a OTP, one-time password code, like on Google Authenticator, where you have to put some numbers. Uh, in general, my answer to this is as long as it's possible to do it automatically somehow, 99% of the cases, it will be possible to do it with AIDA. Um, if it's not possible technically, because it's disallowed by the supercomputer to connect via, without a human doing something, or because by policy it's not allowed. Maybe technically you can still do it, but it's not allowed by security policies. Um, then I mean, it's not a problem of AIDA, it's a problem of any script, even if you write a bash script that wants to submit things, you would have the same problem. So the first thing would be, please check with your supercomputer center if and how they allow a script, not a human, to connect to run simulations. Um, if it's about the one-time password, it's possible. There are 
uh, online on GitHub, uh, there's a script which allows you to return automatically the six digits you have to put. And this can easily be integrated within AIDA. Uh, if it's something else, again, it depends. Practically, very often the solution to this, if the security people don't allow it, is to ask them to have a computer, a node, uh, some, uh, something you can access to, where you can install AIDA inside the supercomputer network. In this way, you have to use the OTP by hand when you want to connect to AIDA to check what's going on. But then the machine when AIDA, where AIDA is running can connect to the supercomputer directly without OTP because it's already inside the network. So you, you shift the problem, but then you solve this issue and then AIDA can connect automatically and submit jobs. Um, I think this uh, should uh, address both questions. There's a very technical question now just asked by uh, Alba to, who, to which uh, John Fang just replied. If you don't find uh, the commands like run AIDA or the Verdi command line, remember you have to run this, what you see here on line three on John Fang slides, uh, which is the command work on AIDA, which enters what's called a Python virtual environment. It's a virtual environment, like, like the name says, where you see all the Python packages about uh, AIDA and the dependencies. This is just to isolate all the dependencies from other calls you've been seeing. You just run that, then you see something on your command line, you see something tells you are inside this AIDA virtual environment, and then from there on, you see all the scripts and the commands. Okay, I think this, this was uh, uh, more or less what was asked on Zoom. Are there any questions here in Twitter from the present participants? Raise your hand. Anyone? Okay. So if not, what I will do is to stop the recording now for the lecture.